came up with a way to ensure that that, that happened reliably. Um, and then some just general techniques that can be useful when working with a database or other things, locking, doing stuff in parallel, and making sure that cleanup happens. So what are some of the pros? Um, you know, bash scripting is, is pretty easy to learn. Uh, it's ubiquitous. It's all over the place if you've got Unix, Linux systems. Uh, it really is good for automating tasks. Um, you know, you can reasonably debug it. Um, and there's a lot of tools. And I think a lot of existing programs that other people have written, kind of in the, uh, you know, the way that people have been Unix, using Unix and Linux for years, you kind of rest on the shoulders of everyone that's gone before you. There's so many useful utilities out there, and you can just kind of combine them all together and not have to rewrite all that stuff by using bash scripting. The cons are that it, you know, it's not that good if you've got really complex tasks to do. And depending on your definition of slow, it's relatively slow. For a lot of things, it's perfectly adequate, but it's not going to be super fast. Um, you have to be careful if you want to make your scripts robust. So, and a lot of stuff that you see that's been scripted it tends not to be all that robust. And there are, as I just said, there's some portability issues between different systems, different versions of the shell, different types of shells. So all of those things, if you need to be portable, you'd have to worry about. So first, what, when I do scripting, I like to have a, a common library that I'm going to, so I can reuse the stuff and not have to have the same functions written over and over again. Um, you don't want that for the, all the obvious reasons. You don't want to end up with the same version of a function in 18 different bash scripts and then trying to keep them in sync becomes impossible. Um, it's, it's good for version control, it's good for testing, and um, it's just a, a place to <coughs> aggregate. So in terms of the, uh, the common function library that I like to use, this is kind of where I start out, and, and some of these things we should talk about. So set minus u is going to throw an error basically any time a script variable is, has not been initialized. You may or may not want this. The other way to do this is within the call to each variable, you can put a question mark at the end of it and then throw an error if that one doesn't exist. I tend to like to make sure that all my, my variables have been defined. You can combine that actually with set minus e, which also which says that the script should exit immediately if there's an error. But again, depending on your context, you know, in some places I've been, they don't like to see this. And in some places, it's considered good practice to exit as soon as you have an error. Set plus x, um, minus x is going to turn on basically debugging. It gives you ex extreme uh, verbose output of everything that's going on in the shell. And so you might, you don't want that on all the time, certainly, but by having it in here, you can just kind of flip that to a minus sign and go into, into a debug mode. But the other thing, that, that is so verbose that you don't always want that. So I often will have if statements around various parts of the code that rely on a, a variable called debug, and so you can flip it in one place and then get some extra output, debug output. This stanza here, the reason I'm doing this is I, you often will need to have the base name of the program that's running and the base directory of the program that's running. But sometimes when you're testing or developing, it's kind of convenient to take this common library and source it to your open shell. And um, if that's the case, depending on the shell, you might get strange looking values for base name and base directory. So this bit here allows you to do some testing if you're going to source this thing into your, into your current shell versus when it's executing within some script that you've written. So this is a pretty straightforward. Base name is just a command line program that'll take the, um, the dollar sign zero is the name of the, the program that's executing. This is just going to give me the base name of it. This read link uh, dash m is going to give me 
the canonical name, so a path. So if someone's called it as dot slash whatever, you're not going to get dot slash. You're going to actually get an expanded directory name. Oh, and the reason I only set um, minus E if this is the case is because it, if I'm running at a command line shell and you turn on that minus E and then an error occurs, it closes your shell, which is kind of inconvenient. I often will need some kind of an output directory, so I usually will specify that as something under the base directory. Obviously, this has got to be some place that you want it to be. Uh, and you don't always want to assume that it already exists, so you might want to just create it forcibly. Same thing in these examples. I'm going to have some SQL files, so I'm doing the same thing for a directory called SQLdir. And then here you can see I've set these variables uh, as read only, so I'm, I'm effectively treating these like an enum. And so again, in my example later on on, um, on locking, I'm going to use these as uh, unlock, no wait, and block as an enum. So I'm going to define them here in the common header. Another thing that you often do is you want to create some kind of a log. You want to create some kind of an output. Um, you want a timestamp on it often because you're going to be running this thing over and over again. You want it to sort correctly when you list a directory. Um, so this is just frequently used as is it something that you're going to append to the name of the output based on a date timestamp. And then this part, what, what this is going to do is if you want all of your output, everything that would go to standard out or standard error to the terminal, you also want it captured to a log file. You can basically turn this on by setting that to 1. And then this T is going to output both to the terminal and to the log file. So again, it, it's some places I've seen where everything just gets sent to a log file, but then when you're running your script on the command line, it's not very convenient because you're not seeing all that unless you're also tailing the log, which of course you can do, but it's just less convenient. No. Now, yeah, you could do it in a function. And I have, in other contexts, I mean, not in this slide deck, but in other contexts, I had a function that would do exactly that. In, in this case, for at least for, the, for these examples, each script is going to include this common once, and so that timestamp at the beginning of the run is more or less appropriate. But yeah, you could definitely put in a function. So then, after all that stuff at the top of the common library, that's when all the functions would be defined. I'm going to go through some of those as we go through the presentation. So now, every time you write a script that uses the common library, the first thing you got to do is kind of bootstrap the use of the common library. So this is my shebang right here. Um, you know, normally it's good practice to put some kind of a description of what this particular script is supposed to do. Because I'm loading this thing, you know, I, I'm often loading it from the same directory that the script is in. You might have a standard location that you want to use for that, in which case you wouldn't need to do this. But in my scripts, at least in this example, I'm again grabbing what is the, what is the full path of the base directory that I'm in, and I'm going to make the assumption that that common library is in there. And then I'm going to source it. And the difference between sourcing it and running it as a command is that it basically gets included in this script in line and gets evaluated versus actually starting another process up, running it, and returning. So in this case, I want all of that stuff available for the rest of my script, so I'm going to source it. The other way to do that, of course, is you can just put a dot instead of the word source. And then if you can't find it, obviously you want to just bail out. OK, so now this is the, the first of the uh, Postgres examples. You know, 
since this is a Postgres talk, the first thing you want to be able to do is execute a query from your bash script, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of different ways you could probably do this. Uh, and in fact, in real common library that I created for at this client, there were probably six or seven different versions of this um, exec SQL or the equivalent. But what I like to do is I like to make them flexible. So I, I have a separate uh, host, port, database name, Postgres user, and delimiter so that I can point this at essentially anywhere. And, and then I'm going to have the SQL string is also going to get passed in as an argument. And then I've got this kind of standard way that I'm now going to call that SQL string. So this is, this is that part of the, that last part, right? I'm going to go through some explanation on these things. The, um, the first thing here that you notice I'm piping the SQL to psql rather than using dash c. And actually, that goes back to a discussion I had on the list with uh, with Tom, actually. I think he was the only one who answered my, my question. But if you're using dash C, that whole string, if it's got multiple statements in it that are delimited by semicolons, the whole string gets passed back to the back end. And then if there's an error somewhere, it just halts. Whereas if you were trying to do something like this, where you've got, you know, that's like off the screen, isn't it? Um, a little better. Something like this where you're doing, um, you know, a begin, you're inserting something, a begin, you're inserting a value, you're committing, then you're going to do another row and then commit and so on. You would expect that each one of those things would happen independently, right? Because you've got them wrapped. But if you're using dash C and there's an error, so in this case, I've got a primary key error. I don't end up with that third commit ever happening. Whereas if you use where if you use the uh, piping it in, you'll see you do get both. And that's because each of those statements is being executed as an independent execution in the back end. So that, um, I know if you try to drop database with E minus C as part of another, um, with, with a multi-part thing with a semicolon, you get an error that says you cannot drop database as part of a multi-statement um, entry. It sounds like you get around that by using the pipe from SQD in. I would guess so. Because that would be the same thing as basically feeding a file to psql. So now, in, in this particular case, I'm actually setting up specifically on error stop to be, to be on. So it's not going to make a difference really here. But if you want, and this is one of the things that you need to consider. Do you want your script to stop with an error if one of the statements in a multi-statement string is errors out? Or do you want it to continue? That's really a decision you got to make. In this particular script, I've said that I want it to stop with an error if there's any errors. This uh, minus QAT uh, you know, is quiet, unaligned, tuples only. So basically, that's going to give me back just the, the data and not all the decoration around it that psql normally creates so that I can do something usually. I want to do something with that data. I don't want to just display it. And then the delimiter allows me to specify specifically what the field separator is going to be. In most cases, I would just use a space, but in some cases, you might want to use something else. An example of that is I've used this sort of thing to run a query and build like an in list that a, for another SQL statement that I'm kind of building and I want to execute. Can you specify the tabulation? Yeah, you can, you can do. Um, I don't know if, I think later on I may have an example of it, but in. in um, but it's not back to dash. It is actually. What you can do is you can say dollar sign. 
um, single quote, backslash T, single quote. And that will specify that that slash T should be considered as an escape. And then, of course, this is the, the normal connection info that I'm going to use. You know, I've, for this kind of pattern, I've been heading towards using Postgres URIs. One, one parameter that's sort of less ambiguous is, is, seems more convenient than a full bar. Yeah, thank, thanks for reminding me of that. Actually, you know, I, as I said, I had like five or six different versions of this thing in the other common library that I did. One of them uses URIs. It, it was added in Postgres 9.2 or 9.3. So as of like 9.2 or 9.3, you can actually build the connection string. It looks just like it would for JDBC, essentially. And you can pass that as, as the connection string instead of having separate host, port, user, and database name. You just have it as a URI, and you can pass that as one. Basically, you pass that as if it were the database name. But I, I don't show that here. I don't have an example of it here, but I have done that. OK, so this is an example of now using that function. Um, I'm going to take, you know, so I, I, in order to compress it on the slides, I had to kind of make this a little bit ugly. but. Um, I've set the host, the port, and, and by the way, this is the way, I don't know if you know this, but if you want to use a connection on your local machine using sockets instead of TCP IP, you can basically specify the socket directory as if it were the host. So that doesn't have to be an IP address. You do need the port, however. Um, and I, I need that on if I'm playing with it on my own machines, because I typically have Postgres set up to run on all different versions on different ports and whatnot. So I'm going to set up my, my connection string and my delimiter. I'm going to run a query that's basically looking for uh, connections that are idle in transaction. And now I can just simply say exec SQL and get a result back. So when I run that, is that big enough to see in the back? Can you guys see that in the back? So you can see the, the form that I get the data back in is, is relatively easy to use. And I, I got more examples of how it actually does get used. So now this is another version of this, more or less the same thing, except this time I'm going to take a file name as an argument. So it's pretty much exactly the same. Um, this is useful if you need persistence for your SQL file. So either you want to have that SQL file defined in advance, so maybe you can keep it in version control. Um, I've used it for things like. Um, Originally, I actually wanted to add to this presentation another example about uh, a script that would control access to a database. It lets you specify a list of users who should be allowed in, and everyone else will get locked out. And one of the things I found when I was developing that script was that if you try and use something like uh, revoking connect access to the database, you can't. That doesn't work with super users. At least it didn't on older versions of Postgres. I don't know, someone told me at some point that they thought that had been changed. Yeah, well, what I ended up doing is, is basically for all of the login users that I don't want to be able to log in, I just alter those users and turn them into groups, essentially. So now they can't log in anymore. But because of that, I had to generate a list of current users, SQL statements from the list of current users that I wanted locked out. But I needed to know who those users were in order to unlock them later on. And there was always the possibility that a new user would get created or one of the existing users would get deleted in between when I locked and when I unlocked. And so I would build, basically, using all this dynamic SQL stuff, I would build SQL statements 
pipe them out to a file, and then I would execute those SQL statements using this version of the, script, of the function. That was also, by the way, how I figured out that problem with the um, dash C, because I had a bunch of statements that were altering users, and in this environment, part of one of their upgrades ended up dropping some users, so they would lock the system using the script, and then part of their upgrade dropped a user somewhere along the line, and then, and then they would try to unlock, and in that list of things that were getting executed, it was trying to unlock a user that no longer existed, and it threw an error. Yeah, I mean, this is a bit contrived because it's just an example for this presentation. But, uh, you know, there are, you know, as I described, there are cases where I was dynamically building SQL and I wanted it out on a file, and I wanted that file date time stamped and all kinds of other stuff, right? So, uh, yeah, you could definitely don't need that in this particular case, but that's just to demonstrate the technique. So now this is great, okay, I can, I can run a query, I can get data back, how do I actually assign that to a variable? Well, if you've got basically a, a scalar value, a single scalar value, that's pretty straightforward. Um, again, I, this method of calling out, basically executing another process is the dollar sign, paren, and paren. So what that does is that executes this in another context, just as if you'd use backticks. So the kind of traditional way to do that was with backticks. This is the more modern way. Uh, the backticks, I think, are actually supposedly even uh, deprecated, um, although I'm not sure they'll ever really go away. Um, but what this will do is it will run that function with this query and then since that's just a single result, it just gets assigned right to that variable, and then you can echo it out. And it works great. But what happens if you've got multiple rows and multiple columns? So if you've got multiple rows and multiple columns, then you can use, this is something that's called a, a here string. Uh, anyone ever heard of a here string? Uh, most people have probably heard of here docs. But what this does is it, it executes that SQL and assigns it to these two variables in the loop. And so if I go out to so now you can see in that first example it just spit back the answer, but now I can actually interact with those two variables in rows and columns. Okay, so now I'm on to the part where I'm going to talk about um, managing functions that you're trying to use. Because as you're building these scripts that are calling SQL, a lot of times it's, you're better off if you can kind of wrap a bunch of the functionality that you're trying to do in the database inside a SQL function. So you're just calling, basically select some SQL function in order to do the work. But if you do that, you might end up as you're maintaining both the function and the script, they could get out of sync. So what this function is going to do, this particular function just takes uh, a schema name, a file name, a list of arg types, um, and an MD5, and it just tries to do a, a lookup in the system catalog to see if this particular function already exists and the MD5 matches, which means the, the source of the, of the function matches. And then executes that, that query. So you may or may not be familiar with this, but it, the combination of the schema, the function name, and the arg types is actually the function signature. That's how 
Postgres figures out which specific function you're trying to execute. And then by taking the, this pgget function def of the OID of that function, feeding it to MD5, you're essentially getting a signature on the actual source code of that function. So then there's another, another bash function that you need to support this. Is basically, this is a function that's going to check that signature, see if that exact match exists. If it already does exist, it does nothing. And if it doesn't exist, it does a create or replace to replace it in lines. So that before you use it, you can ensure that the correct version of your function already exists. So the beginning of this thing is taking, basically uh, uh, define the, um, the function name to include the schema, the function name, or the, the file name, I should say, includes the schema, the function name, um, dash, and then the arg types. And this is going to parse all that out. So these three things are just taking the SQL file name and using cut to pull out pieces of it. And then it's doing an MD5 sum of the actual SQL file. And so the rest of this is going to then use that with the function we just talked about looking up for a match. And so if it doesn't find the match, it just executes the file with the, with the file execution function that we talked about earlier. So that's going to do a create or replace. So now there's one more piece that ma it makes this easier to use. If you're creating a function like, say, this this is a trivial, again, a, a contrived but example, but if you, if you execute this to create a function and you use that get function def, it actually kind of formats it in a specific way, a little bit nicer, but if you're trying to match on an MD5, that's not going to work. So once you, you've created the function in the database kind of manually, this script will take, will find that function and export it to the SQL file in a way that it'll exactly match the MD5 that comes from running the MD5 on the get function def output. Does that make sense? So now finally, once you've got all that in place, you know, you've got a script that's going to be using this function. You specify what's, what's the SQL file that I want to match against, and then I just call this CR SQL func, and it's going to do that check. So if the function already exists and the MD5 matches, it does nothing, essentially. But if it doesn't match, it'll take that file, that SQL file on disk, do the create or replace. And now when I'm using that function, I can be sure that the function that exists in Postgres is going to match the one I expect here in my bash script. Okay, so now some more general stuff that um, you know is not specific to Postgres, but the examples are, are using it with Postgres. If you want to do a concurrent execution lock, you, there may be you know you may want that because you've got something that's going to run for a long time uses a lot of resources. You don't want two people manually starting it up at the same time and end up, or, or three, or maybe you're running on a cron job and it runs every five minutes and something happens and it, gets, it could get stacked up. So you want to have a way to, to lock the use of the script so it can only one time, it can only run once at a time, essentially. And some examples of that are, you know, if you're doing a, a forced vacuum or uh, and, and this is actually a, a live example that, that I had in the environment I was working in. Uh, there was kind of a mixed uh, OLTP and data that was coming from legacy systems and getting bulk loaded into the production systems. And the people who were doing the data movement didn't want to be bothered with running vacuums or anything like that after they bulk loaded. And I'm not sure how many people here are familiar with this, but when you bulk load data, it's a good practice to run a vacuum on the table or vacuum analyze on the table 
one, to update your statistics, and two, to also set all the hint bits. Because otherwise, the first time a row gets read after it's been loaded, there's going to be actual write that'll go on that you may find surprising. So this function is going to make use of a, a, a Linux command called fflock. Um, I've set this up so that it, it could either be blocking or non-blocking. And again, I've got a, 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 in the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip trying to run it, but um, I've got a script in that GitHub repo that demonstrates the use of this thing. So you can e call it to either immediately exit if it can't get the lock, or you can call it to block if it can't get the lock. And then the other half of that is you might want to unlock. So if you're doing some kind of long operation, you might want to lock, some, lock for some period of time and then unlock explicitly. So this is the function that, the example function that's calling it. It's going to attempt to grab the lock. And, I'll, and uh, this no wait is telling it basically not to block. So if it doesn't get it right away and no wait, it's just going to fall back and actually block. OK, the next thing you might want to do um, is parallel work. And that, you know, of course, if you're doing something like, um, Again, real life scenario, we same environment, we're working with Sloney clusters, and they wanted to be able to do kind of a snapshot backup of a Sloney cluster and then a, a way to restore to some point in time for testing purposes. And so bec because not all the tables were OLTP, only the OLTP tables are essentially participating in the replication with Sloney the bulk loaded tables were all being loaded on all three sites independently. So we needed to be actually able to load tables at three different sites, and some of these things were fairly large. You want to be able to do them all at the same time. You don't want to do one site, sit there and block in your script until it's done after an hour. You want to get all three of them done in that hour. So the, the example script that I've got is going to run three queries. Um, as separate background task. Bash actually has a wait command. So if you launch three sub-processes that are asynchronous and then say wait, it'll sit there and, and wait for all three of them to finish. So it's kind of a nice way to do asynchronous parallelism. So this particular script, it's basically got a, a timed five second sleep and Without it, parallelism, it would take 15 seconds, but it's going to only take f five seconds because it's going to do it in parallel. Now, the, the first kind of simple method to do this is just to simply background the execution. So you can do that right within your bash script, and then that subprocess will get backgrounded and it runs asynchronously. And then the wait statement will sit there and wait until those three things finish. The problem with that is, um, you can't capture the results of that. So if you wanted to capture the results, this method doesn't basically hook those processes up to your standard out. And, and so you don't get that result. There's no way to gather that into a variable if you wanted to. There's another way to do it uh, using something called coproc. But coproc has some bugs. And I, I, when I was going through these slides, I did some research. And it, it looks like the bug in coproc is acknowledged and has been there for at least several years and hasn't been fixed. But what I found was that if I wanted to be able to capture the output of these three executions, I needed a fourth one, which was kind of a dummy. Because whatever one was last never got hooked up to, to the uh, standard out. And so you couldn't get that result. So by having the fourth one here, it sort of works around that bug in coproc and lets me read that result back into the buffer. It also has an issue in that it, it, it outputs these warnings uh, that you're trying to do stuff in parallel, which makes no sense because it actually works. You can see that this thing executed in five seconds and I got all three results just like I expected. One, uh, bug or 
utilized it for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, that's important safety tip, I suppose. If you're doing stuff on the same database, that could be, a, that could be an issue. In, in most of the instances where I've done this sort of thing, it's been because I've been trying to do something in parallel across multiple hosts. But certainly it would be valid that you might be trying to do something in parallel on the same host. Or that you think you should be, but maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah. All right, so finally I'm going to cover uh, cleaning up. You know, often in these scripts you're going to create some sort of files. Uh, some temp files, you may not want to leave them laying around either for security reasons or just cleanliness reasons. Um, you might have a script that is doing things as you go along and then if there's an error, you don't want to leave things in sort of this partially executed state. So you want to be able to unroll some of the effects of what you've done. Um, and, and you can also use it, and I have used it, in fact, we had a set of scripts that were being used for a fairly lengthy um, migration that was going on. And because of the length of the migration and some issues on the network <coughs> and the number of times that we were having to do it, we were finding that occasionally the thing would bomb out because of a network issue right in the middle of the script. And we wanted to be, it was something that would take hours. And we wanted to be able to just start right back up where we were. And so you can use, uh, you can actually use a trap to sort of write out to a file an indication of where you were in that script so that when you go to run it another time, you restart it, it just goes right to where you want it to start and it picks right back up. So to make it easier to do that, I actually created this function cleanup. Um, what it's going to do, it's going to evaluate the elements of an array, and this is so I can, and it does it in reverse order. So I'm iterating backwards there, and that's so that as I'm using this thing, I can basically stack undo tasks onto a queue, essentially. It's like popping them onto the top, or pushing them onto the top and then popping them back off as the trap executes at the end. So these examples here, this, I'm, I'm going to set up SQL that truncates table T1, and I'm going to create this element, which is just the, um, I'm going to echo what I'm doing, and then I'm going to use that execute SQL function to execute that specific SQL. I'm just going to set that as array element zero. And then this SQL is going to insert some values into this table T2. So these are basically the, the things I want to do if this particular script errors out, these, this is what I want to do to clean up. And then finally, once I've built that array with these two tasks, I just set a trap. Trap, clean up, and I'm saying I want to run that trap on either a SIGINT or an error. So an error is, is going to be basically any time the script errors, and a SIGINT is going to be if someone were got impatient and hit control C or if someone killed it, right? So now the rest of this script just for demonstration purposes is going to insert some values into T, T1, it's going to truncate T2, it's going to show the count of the records in those tables and then I put in there the ability to have the thing sleep so that you'd have time to hit control C and see the effect of the, of the trap executing. So that one. Oh. So now you can see that my trap executed and I inserted back into T2 and truncated T1 and actually if I go to here you can see that my, oh, you can't see it. You can see that T1 is back to no rows and T2 is four. So my trap successfully reset that table. And this 
this just shows you what I just showed you, basically. And if you let it complete successfully, then the rows don't get unmodified. So that's it. Any questions? Why don't you use PV anywhere? <laughs> because I didn't know about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a really easy. PV uh, is basically called type viewer. I know how to get it all up to you. Get the cuffs with some double brackets. Uh, again, the double brackets is a, is the considered to be the more modern way to do the if test. I think um, there is a technical difference in the way it gets executed. I think the double brackets are actually built into the bash shell, whereas the old single brackets were like a sim link to the test function. Is that correct? I think they're both actually built in now. I, you're right. That's how it used to be. But I'm pretty sure bash has got yeah. Everything, I, everything I've read seems to recommend that you use the double brackets now when you're doing the I think, test. I think what it actually provides is more functionality. And there is, yeah, there is some more functionality that comes with it. That's why people recommend it. If you're using Bash anyway and you're sticking to Bash, just use it just because it has the functionality. Yeah, so the old one, the old style might be built in, but it's still compatible with the original semantics. Yep. Anything else? I'll take that under consideration. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a good point. And actually, in the environment where I was working, they had you know official coding guidelines which said you should do that. Um, and it's it's a good idea, I think. But you know, one thing is if you are building stuff into a library, uh, and then everyone's just using those functions, that's kind of getting abstracted away for them anyway. So uh, I I tend to be a, I'm not a very good typist, so I'm a lazy when it comes to that. So I tend to use the short arguments. Yeah, and, and in fact, in, in the scenario where I was doing this, we, we had exactly that, and all of that stuff was getting pushed off to Splunk, and so, yeah, you can definitely, definitely do that. So I think we're, we're actually a couple of minutes over, so um, any other questions, please find me, I guess, between now and when everyone leaves. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>